Military leadership is one of the most crucial components to winning wars. Generals lead their armies and make decisions that can make or break their nation's success. Some generals are exceptional, others not so much. Often, military talent is a complicated subject. Up until this point, our coverage of the campaigns of Eastern Roman general Belisarius has been largely positive. From victory to victory, he has displayed leadership qualities that have been almost optimal and overcome terrible odds. For the reunification of the Roman Empire, his efforts have been a massive benefit. But based on the title of this video, you've probably figured out it's not all sunshine and roses. So what went wrong? What was Belisarius missing here? Today, we'll get a chance to see what qualities he didn't have that led to the ruin of his military campaign. Okay, so quick recap. The Eastern Roman Empire was invading Italy against the Ostrogothic Kingdom, which dominated the peninsula after the fall of the Western Empire. This was all part of Emperor Justinian's big plan to re-establish Roman rule in the West. Belisarius was the general in charge of leading the expedition, and right now, he was chilling in Rome. He had captured most of southern Italy in the first months of the war and had successfully defended the city of Rome in a year-long siege against the Ostrogothic king, a guy named Vitiges. This was all a part of Belisarius' brilliant campaign plan, and he had totally outclassed the Goths at almost every turn. Now, with the Goths defeated and retreating from Rome, it was once again time for Belisarius to go on the offensive. Just because the Goths were defeated didn't mean they were out of the fight. Belisarius knew this thing was going to take time, patience, skill, and a little bit of luck. The Gothic army was currently heading northward toward Ariminum. Recently, Belisarius had sent a sub-commander named John behind enemy lines with a large contingent of cavalry to harass and put pressure on the Goths. John did so, at first, but over the following days he exceeded his orders and marched all the way to Ariminum, which was only a short ways down the road from the Gothic capital of Ravenna. John occupied the city, but now there were tens of thousands of angry Goths on their way to get him out. This was terrible. Roman forces were overextended and Belisarius knew there was no way John's small force could hold out in a siege. They needed to get out of there ASAP. Since the Romans controlled the Via Flaminia, the Goths were forced to take the scenic route. Because of this, Belisarius was able to get messengers to John, ordering him to abandon the city and link up with the rest of the army. Only days later, the messengers returned without John. He had said no. Wait, he said no? What? Why would he do something so silly? Belisarius was perplexed by John's insubordination. It's not clear why John disobeyed this order, but it is clear the two men had a deeply strained relationship. It's possible John had a strategic disagreement, but it's also possible he simply didn't like Belisarius and wanted to elevate his own standing in the Roman government. Regardless, with John refusing to leave Ariminum, there was nothing Belisarius could do about the situation. As the Gothic army arrived, they set up a siege and cut the city's food supplies. Now. Belisarius had decisions to make. Around this time, a Roman general named Narses arrived in Italy with a force of around 7,000 men. After taking a couple smaller cities near Rome, Belisarius took most of his army to meet up with Narses, where the two could discuss the John situation. Narses was a personal friend and ally of John. He advocated for a direct approach, marching to Ariminum and breaking the siege. The cautious Belisarius protested, arguing they should first clear out some of the walled cities along the way. The Goths had failed to clear out the cities the Byzantines held along the way to Rome and were punished for it. Belisarius did not want to repeat their mistake. Narses respected his caution but continued to argue that time was of the essence and taking the walled cities would take too long. They had reached an impasse. The arguing continued until finally time had run out. A message had been received from John, which effectively said, Hey guys, just letting you know, I only have seven days of food left. If you don't get me out of here by then, I'm giving up. What a dork. Obviously, Belisarius couldn't let that happen, so he marched northwards with the rest of the army, 
bypassing the walled cities. To get the Goths away from Ariminum, Belisarius came up with a brilliant plan. Scare them off. How? By making a massive, massive display of military force. One problem. They didn't actually have a massive, massive military force. To Belisarius, this was no more than a minor inconvenience. He split his army into two groups, which would simultaneously advance along two roads, one coastal and one inland. At the same time, the Roman navy would sail up the Adriatic towards Ariminum. At night, when the armies encamped, they lit dozens of extra campfires to exaggerate the size of their army. The Goths first encountered the inland force led by Belisarius. Thinking this was the whole Roman army, they prepared for battle. That evening, Gothic scouts sighted another massive Roman army approaching from the coast. Now things were getting concerning. When they woke the next morning to find the Roman fleet had appeared outside the city, panic struck, and the Goths made a hasty retreat to Ravenna. Belisarius pulled off a flawless victory in which the enemy abandoned their objective at the cost of no lives. Successful in pitched battles and sieges, Belisarius was now accomplished in psychological warfare as well. John was reunited with Narses and Belisarius, and the internal divisions began to kick into overdrive. For starters, John refused to acknowledge Belisarius' role in his saving, only extending his thanks to Narses, to whom John owed his whole career. Next, he began openly questioning Belisarius' role as the supreme commander, instead advocating for Narses to take over. Later, in a strategy meeting, Narses and John again became insubordinate, dismissing Belisarius' plan to capture the towns they had left behind and declaring that they would be taking their army to attack the Goths in Amelia, no matter what Belisarius chose to do with his army. Frustrated by all this malarkey, a tense argument broke out. Accusing the two officers of insubordination, Belisarius pulled the seniority card and brought out his letter of appointment from Justinian. With it, he declared the decision was his, and only his, to make. Narses, however, was a cunning politician, and argued that the verbiage of the letter was too unclear. It only gave Belisarius command of, again, his army. Narses and John were free to do as they wished with their army. Unable to assert his authority and unable to reach an agreement, the generals split and went in different directions. Belisarius took his force south and set up sieges at Irvaventus and Urbinus. Meanwhile, from Ariminum, Narses ridiculed Belisarius, decrying his actions as pointless folly as he ordered John to attack Caesena. Narses' criticism wasn't necessarily without merit. As they began to encircle the city, it was looking like these sieges were going to take some time. But only a short while later, Belisarius caught a lucky break when the water supply of Urbinus failed and the city was forced to surrender. Not long after, Irvaventus surrendered in suit. Narses ate his words. Around this time, the Goths had amassed a huge army and were besieging the town of Milan. Wait, Milan? Where do they factor into this? Well, during the siege of Rome, Belisarius received envoys from Milan who invited his army to take control of the city as soon as possible. When he got the chance, Belisarius sent a force of 1,000 men to garrison Milan's walls. Now, they were in dire straits. Reinforcements had already been sent, but they were stuck trying to cross the Po River in some bad weather. Only John's army was nearby in any position to help. Urgently, Belisarius sent messengers ordering John to rush to their aid, but as before, he simply refused to follow Belisarius' orders. Perplexed again by John's horrible decision making, Belisarius began writing to Narses, pleading with him to order John to Milan's aid. Narses agreed to do so, and after wasting several critical days, John set out for Milan. Shortly after, reports came in that John was no longer needed, for there was no more Milan. The garrison of Milan had struck a deal with the Goths. In exchange for their lives, they gave up the city. Note the verbiage. The Goths agreed to spare the lives of the garrison. Only the garrison. In retribution for their defiance, the city of Milan was razed to the ground. Tens of thousands of Milanese citizens were slaughtered or dragged off into slavery. 
The Gothic army then marched to the other side of the Po from the Roman reinforcements, leading to a tense standoff. John's delay had cost the Romans dearly. What a disaster. Belisarius was infuriated. He wrote a scathing letter to Justinian, blaming John and Narses for the fall of Milan and demanding clarification on who was in charge. Justinian wrote back, this time in crystal clear language, Belisarius is and was always the senior commander, no exceptions. With consideration to his insubordination, Narses was recalled to Constantinople. In my opinion, Belisarius acted way too late here. At the first sign of trouble, he should have written Justinian. Instead, Narses and John were able to dither about, eschewing the chain of command for weeks, and it ended up costing the lives of thousands. Belisarius' inability to control his junior commanders had seriously damaged the war effort. Nevertheless, the campaign continued. As spring came and went, famine began to ravage the Italian peninsula because of the mass devastation to the region. Since the Romans could import their supplies, they had an easier time, but the Goths were feeling it. Belisarius, now in full control of the 11,000-man army, set up a siege at Oximus. The city had requested help from Vitiges multiple times, but the Gothic king could not move due to supply issues. Seeking any kind of assistance, Vitiges sent diplomatic missions to the Sassanid Empire, hoping to prompt an invasion on Justinian's eastern border. Justinian's web of spies learned of the Gothic diplomats and they informed Justinian to the emperor's great alarm. The entire concept of Justinian's wars was predicated on peace with Persia. Fighting on two fronts was not an option. He wrote to Khosrow trying to soothe his ego, but to no luck. Predicting the worst, he knew it was time to wrap things up in Italy. Meanwhile, Belisarius had quickly taken over the last couple cities on the way to Ravenna. No longer overextended, he was free to march on the Gothic capital. They arrived outside the walls of Ravenna in late 539. Vitiges tried to open negotiations for surrender, feeling the hopelessness of his situation. Belisarius entertained this, but sent contingents to secure Venetia and the Cadian Alps during negotiations. Most of Italy was now under Roman control. After over four years of hard work, only Ravenna remained. As winter came, a new directive arrived from Constantinople. Justinian was offering peace. The Romans were to annex all of Italy up to the Po River, and everything north would be the Goths' domain. Vitiges felt obliged to sign the treaty, but when it arrived in Belisarius' camp for his signature, the famed general refused to sign. Infuriated, Belisarius would not give up when total victory was so close. He had spent almost five years working towards this end, and now he was being asked to leave his project incomplete? Outrageous. With the future of the Gothic aristocracy now uncertain, they devised a new plan. They would simply offer Belisarius the title Emperor of the West. Under this plan, even Vitiges lent his full support. If Belisarius accepted, the war was finished. There was no way Justinian could muster another force large enough to invade Italy again. The Goths also knew Belisarius to be an honorable man who would make a great ruler. Surely he would accept, right? Well, not so fast. The honorable Belisarius saw a chance to manipulate the Goths. He agreed to the offer nominally, but stipulated the coronation must be done in front of Vitiges inside Ravenna. The Goths went along with this, and after going through all the motions, Belisarius and the Roman army were allowed inside the gates of Ravenna. Once there, Belisarius ordered the Gothic treasury move to Constantinople. He had taken this city for the empire. The Goths had been tricked. They were completely shocked. It was now midsummer of 540, and the victorious Belisarius was now leaving Italy for Persia. While the bloodless capture of Ravenna was an act of military brilliance, it turned out to be a horrible miscalculation. In refusing to sign the peace treaty, he had not only directly disobeyed Justinian, but undermined the emperor's authority. Coupled with the fact the title Emperor of the West had been thrown around with Belisarius' name on it, any trust Justinian had in his best general was gone. Their relationship was horribly damaged. His betrayal fomented further rebellion among the Goths. They had been content to let him rule, 
and most of them were on the way to Ravenna to capitulate. When they heard of his betrayal, they were outraged. Mere months after he left, the Goths enjoyed a resurgence under a new energetic king, Totila. What should have been an easy mop-up job for the occupying Roman forces became a rout as Totila's forces swept south. When Belisarius was forced to return to Italy, he would never get the resources he needed to truly win due to his strained relationship with Justinian. Not only that, Justinian was hesitant to give any of his generals the resources they needed due to the fears in his mind that were largely validated by Belisarius. Lastly, the general's presence was badly needed in the east. The Persian threat was serious, and in the couple months it took for him to secure Ravenna, the Persians had already declared war. With little standing in Khosrow's way, the Persian army was able to freely march across Syria and plunder huge amounts of gold. Belisarius' insubordination had cost the empire dearly in several ways. While there were plenty of brilliant moments in the Italian campaign that give it the appearance of success, it was ultimately a failure. In a couple years, the Romans would have to run the whole thing back. Belisarius' role in this failure was blatant. As a general, a crucial trait he clearly lacked was the ability to command loyalty among subordinates, which may well be the most important trait a general can have. What good is anything else if you can't control your sub-commanders? How can you effectively lead if you're constantly losing the initiative to internal army politics? Had he been able to exert his authority in a timelier manner? Perhaps the campaign could have been ended sooner and to much better results. As of now, our coverage of the generalship of Belisarius has come to an end. While there's more campaigning to do and Belisarius would continue to play a role, the defining event over the next few years would become the arrival of the bubonic plague. Its effects across all aspects of society were immense, and in understanding these campaigns, it's crucial to also understand the plague. Fortunately, you don't have to go too far. I've already covered the plague in great detail, so go check it out. Finally, lots of you guys have messaged me asking for a face reveal. Enough of these requests have been coming in that I figured, what the heck, it's about time. So here we go. Yes, this is me. Here I am. I am the one who pulls the levers of animation, the proverbial man behind the curtain. I can already hear some of you asking, hey man, what's with the weird clothes? Well, soon enough, I'm going to be taking you on a journey to medieval England. We'll be immersed in a story of spite and revenge, a tale of mischief, murder, and mayhem, a true Game of Thrones. So, join me in the not too distant future as we explore the Wars of the Roses. Until then, catch me on Patreon where in exchange for helping a small content creator keep the lights on, you'll find additional content, updates, early access to videos, and more. All for as little as $3 a month. Wow. Less than a cappuccino. What a deal. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I will see you in England.